wanna talk? So let's talk. Good evening, good evening, and welcome. It's Talk to Solomon time. That's me, Stan Solomon, my co-host. Chief Steve. Former Police Chief Steve Davis and our guest of honor, Major General Jerry Curry, U.S. Army retired. General, good evening. Good evening. How are both of you tonight? Not bad for old farts, I'll tell you. Um, oh. <laughs> well, I speak more for me than for, for the chief. He is... Well, I'm catching up. Yeah, he's, he's trying to catch up, but he's going to stay behind. Uh, unlike our president, who was, who's always been a behind. All right, <laughs> now, let us talk about our president, Barack O'Buttbreath, uh, who has now been called a dithering, controlling, risk-adverse U.S. president. Now, this was an insider account by um, a, a former person involved in the, the White House uh, who said that Barack Obama filters everything through political considerations, which is why his foreign uh, relations record is, is as abysmal as it is. You've dealt at, at very high levels with decisions from the executive branch. Certainly you've run into people that put politics ahead of either principle or practicality, have you not? Oh, yeah, but not like this one. Now, I would assume that he has set new records. Um, one of the things that, that we have seen is this, uh, this so-called uh, uh, sequester uh, has been totally couched in political terms, and now we're finding internal emails saying, don't make it look any less bleak than we said it was. Do whatever you have to do to make our predictions come true. Uh, they're, you know, they're buying $400,000 worth of art and, and firing our teachers. It's insanity. Yeah, and it's insanity, and, and it's the way he does things, you know. He, he looks at it through a political prism only because that's the only prism he has. You know, here's a guy who's never run a company. He's uh, somebody who has, who has never run a school, for example. He has, uh, there's just nothing that he has, he has never run a business. So the guy really has no prism to look through except the one that he's familiar with, which is being a community organizer, which is a political job. And so he sees everything in the political sphere. What's scary, in my opinion, Chief? <clears throat> well, whether Barack Obama is a genius at <clears throat> uh, foreign policy or whether he's a dithering idiot, as this story alludes to, which I'm sure he is, it doesn't really matter because his objective is to destroy America to destroy freedom, to destroy our military, and turn us into a primitive uh, <clears throat> socialist country of his demise. So while people concentrate on whether or not he's, a, he's good or bad at, at foreign policy, I don't think it matters, because whether he's good or bad, he's just intent on destroying our freedom and our country. Uh, Chief, I, I'm inclined to, to be with you. I don't think it matters either. Uh, he, he does want to um, destroy this country, but there's another aspect of that and that is he really wants control, 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 control. Control of every aspect of our lives. And uh, he would be a wonderful dictator in a communist country. Well, you know, Chavez just died. I'm going to ask for your thoughts about the ramifications of the death of Hugo Chavez of Venezuela. Well, could, could, could we change jobs? Well, I'm just going to say now that there's an opening, you know, let's do a, an even trade. We'll give them Obama and five future draft choices for a bus driver a, a, you know, and some coffee. Good idea. Okay, well, we'll have to send that on to whomever's in charge. China has once again increased their defense budget by double digits. They are building the, a military to not compete with ours, but to defeat ours, and Obama is just as quickly reducing ours as they are increasing theirs. Your thoughts? Uh, that sounds right to me. Uh, that's what he intends to do. 
I think, across the board, is weakened the United States of America at the at our expense, uh, encouraging other countries, of course, to become militarily stronger. Uh, look what look look what he's doing for the uh, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood down in Egypt right now. Uh, these folks won't even let us uh, interview the the Benghazi people who were there, uh, eyewitnesses. We can't interview them because they won't let us. And uh, he just gave them uh, you know, a quarter billion dollars. Not bad. Well, we can go into that discussion. We have the Abrams tanks, the F-16s, the cash, the diplomatic recognition, the lack of criticism for overt attempts to uh, eliminate freedom and democracy. Uh, we found out that we're secretly training the, the Muslim Brotherhood terrorists in Syria. Uh, we are propping up a, a Muslim Brotherhood government in Libya. Uh, don't you think it's, it's and, and of course in, in Tunisia where this all allegedly started, uh, they just finally convicted one of these Muslim uh, extremists of murdering uh, one of the, the uh, opposition people that wasn't a Muslim extremist. Why is it that the American people seem to be comfortable with this? Yeah, why are the American people comfortable with this fellow uh, in the White House? I, I don't understand that. Uh, why were they comfortable re-electing him? Didn't make any sense to me, but we did it, and and, and we're now going to live with this guy for four years. And still, people today, when they take polls, say uh, the country's going in the wrong direction. We're doing everything wrong, but we like Obama. Well, uh, let me say that you're right, but with all due respect. I don't think we re-elected this guy. I think the election was stolen. I think there was massive cheating. Of course, the Republicans should get a, 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 a merit badge in, in stupidity because by giving Ron Paul the finger and, and cheating him out of his delegates, which wouldn't have changed the outcome one iota, four million Republicans that voted for McCain, of all people, didn't come out and vote for Romney. That's what handed the election. Uh, to Obama, he didn't win because of him. He won because our side was stupid and his side cheats. Our, our side has not improved. That's true. Well, just a minute, Chief. <clears throat> well, you, you mentioned the GOP and you said something about stupidity, but I think it's backbone. They knew what was going on. They knew that there was cheating going on. They don't, they don't have the guts to stop it. That's what the real, really the problem is. But there's, there's elitists on both sides. I don't want to just blame... Uh, Obama in this, the, the GOP is, at blame, is to blame it w uh, as well, but you're right about this election, and, and the, strategically it was very poorly done, and it, unless you can gather your base together to come out and fight the war, you're never going to win. But, but I want to mention something about Obama, too. Obama was raised as a Muslim. As his, in his youth, he went to many Muslim schools. He, he wanted to be called Barry for a long time, but as a young adult, he then changed and took on his Muslim name of Barack. It's very significant. He has a soft place in his heart for the Muslims of the world, especially in Egypt, and he never t calls them terrorists. He believes that they're freedom fighters. He has disdain for our American troops who are fighting for our freedom and has admiration for the Muslim fighters who he believes, who he believes in his mind, I, I really believe this, that they're freedom fighters, and he admires them also because the Muslims want world domination. As the general alluded to, Barack Obama wants control of everything, just like the Muslims do. Yeah, but he doesn't want it as the American president. He sees the American presidency as a stepping stone toward, I don't know, the uh, Secretary General of the United Nations or maybe the head of the Arab League. Uh, I'm not sure. General, what do you think? Yeah, somewhere, somewhere around there. Maybe, maybe he wants to be Grand Emperor. How's that sound? Or maybe he wants to be the 12th <laughs> Imam. You know, that would oh, be perfect. Oh, that's even better. Because, you know, he's been down the well for some time, mostly fornicating with boys, and... Now that he's out, even though he's married to Miss Buick, but uh, I believe that, uh, you know, when it all comes down to it, he wants to come out as both a homosexual and a Muslim. Is that allowed? I didn't know. Uh, I have uh, only, if, only if he's in charge. Oh, if he's in charge and he makes it okay. Now, General, you're not going to take part in this conversation, I know, because you're a nice guy, so let me change subjects. You're absolutely right. Um <laughs> <laughs> uh, in, in England, where they now call it Londonistan because they've given free reign to the Muslim radicals who have destroyed 
a lot of England. Uh, they now have uh, not a Muslim uh, MP, but a, a, a British MP who is saying, and let me quote him, disabled children are too costly and they should be put down. Did you hear that? Yep, I heard it. Now, I, other than to say that this guy should be given a lobotomy with a rusty spoon and and hit him on the head with a, a you know a, a liquor bottle to as his anesthesia, how do you respond to this kind of callousness, godlessness, ignorance, meanness, whatever you want to call it? You know, I, I think I think I don't understand the Brits. By the way, I, I I think what the Brits ought to do is very simple. They ought to say you are unacceptable. We will not have somebody voicing those kind of opinions as a prime minister or up here in the in the uh, in the Congress. We will not tolerate it. And if you keep it up, you're out of this country. And I'd kick him out of the country. Well, here's what he said. And let's, let's be fair, let's give all this. His name is Brewer. He said the remarks were designed to provoke a debate. He said, I was wrong. I admit it. I will continue to apologize, but I won't resign. He said it was a quote-unquote flippant remark. Now, I'm a Christian. I want to be considerate, so I think we should forgive him and then hang him but, uh, and, and wash our hands so the rope will not be infected. But I believe what we saw or what we see in these kind of comments, and by the way, the head of the, I'm sorry, the man who sits in the ethics chair for Princeton University has said that a child should be able to be terminated up until it is, has reached its first full year of life because he said, based on the quote-unquote the Bible, a child is not really uh, counted until it reaches one year of age. So he said you should be able to abort up until that age. Did you hear that? His name is Singer, by the way. Yeah, I think he would... Uh he would be a good example. The, the way you handle fellows like him is you, you tie him across the mouth of a cannon and you pull the lanyard. <laughs> right. and, and you're that inconsiderate of the, of the ordinance that you would let it go out with that besmirching on its, uh, on its point? Absolutely. We, 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 can, we can sanitize it later. Okay. That's the least we can do for the least of us, although... We know what that uh, what Christ said about the least of us. I want to um, go back to the sequester for a moment. An internal government email sent Monday instructed an official with a subdivision of the U.S. Department of Agriculture to make sure the sequester-related cuts inflict as much pain as possible and to make sure you're not contradicting what we said the impact would be. Now, to me, that sounds like a criminal act. What would be your thought? I think it is, and and uh, I don't. If we had an attorney general who was worth his salt, uh, we could put him to work on the case. But this guy, of course, uh, will just simply look in the other direction. But yes, I th I think that's a criminal case, and I think it's it's something we ought to investigate. And if we can make a real case for it, not just not just a show trial. But if we can make a real case for this, we ought to go for him. Chief? Well, it's been my observation that many things in this world that uh, would be illegal for any of us to do or any corporation to do, the government does it every day and it's legal for them. So they make up these laws and they make up these rules that don't apply to them. It's just, for example, if someone in, in our neighborhood needed some money, we had some destitute uh, old lady and we decided to go to our neighbors and, and rouse them up and grab their money and give it to her, we'd be in prison for robbery. But the government does that to us every single day. So, yep. so what, yep. what this story just illustrates to me that it's okay for, for the government, but it's not okay for anybody else. We know that... Have you ever seen a fight? There was one that was on, on video on the Internet uh, a few days or maybe a week ago where some guy got in the ring with an ex-professional football player who was probably half again his size uh, and the guy the, the professional football player in this 
boxing match where the guy would get so much money if he stayed in the ring and was for charity, whatever it was for. Uh, and, the, and the boxer, the, the professional ball player, football player, threw a punch. It wasn't even the same ring with the guy. It, it didn't come within a foot of him, and the guy fell down and passed out. Uh, and would ask later, saying, well, did it hurt? He said the thought of what it would do was sufficient. I was out of there. Now, yeah. somehow, <laughs> that's what the sequester is, where a week, two weeks, a month before any impact would have taken place, we see people being furloughed. We see uh, there's a, a story on Rush Limbaugh today where a woman whose husband's been in the military for 30 years, he is currently deployed uh, in either Afghanistan or, or somewhere. He's deployed. She has a serious medical issue that's been determined, diagnosed. They closed the office. They laid off all of the people in the office where she has to go to get a referral to go see a specialist about her particular problem. I don't know exactly what it was, but it was very serious. And they said, and they had a note on the door, because of sequester. The only problem was, it was a week before sequester, and sequester wouldn't have involved this uh, part of government for at least 30 days, and it was military, so by law, it's exempted from budget yep. cuts. Hello? Yeah, well, this sequester business, I, I, I said earlier, uh, this is all show business. This is this isn't serious stuff. Uh, I, you know, I, I have worked in in the Washington at the top levels, and uh, I have been even more than that. I have been in command of a large number of troops. And if you're the boss, you're expected to do what's right, and it doesn't really matter whether there's a piece of paper. Uh, to the uh, to the, saying the opposite or not, you look at the paper and say, "Fine, that's good." Throw it in the trash can. Now you go out right now and do what I'm telling you, and that's the way you handle these kinds of things. You sure don't get in. You don't care. I didn't. I you know when you get in combat, you really don't care, and I didn't care. If you if you care too much about following out the paper orders in the Pentagon, you end up with a lot of dead people on your hands, and they're all yours. And so you, you just sort of look at what makes sense, you do what makes sense, and if people get in the way, you get rid of them. Well, the general's right, and, and he knows uh, from his military experience that, for example, when it's time to eat, the lowliest little private in the, in the unit, if he doesn't get fed, the boss makes sure that that's taken care of. No one is exempt from, from, from their dues in the military. So if that, if that would happen, for example, if, if the, the, the lowly little private doesn't get his meal and can't get satisfaction from the mess hall cook, well, then the, the boss is going to come in, whatever level he is, and make sure that gets taken care of. If not, you go somewhere else. You go to the next level mess hall. That, that guy's going to get fed. The same with the, with the medical care. That's what's supposed to happen. And so, uh, th like the general said, this is just a showboat operation. They close this clinic just for show, and then the military families suffer. They're talking now, General, that a, cr a carrier, I think it's the Truman, is not going to be deployed to the Middle East because of the sequester. When we all know that both the Republicans, uh, uh, th that the Republicans in the <clears throat> House and the Senate have agreed that Barack Obama could alter the cuts to a a whatever area they wouldn't affect, and they're specifically the military, Social Security beneficiaries, uh, those type of things, national security, our borders, uh, and yet he has specifically done what every political subdivision in the history of America has always done, threaten things in order to get higher taxes or get their way, but they don't do those things. Cities don't actually close fire departments and police departments, even though they'll make those threats. He's actually closing things down. He's going to make sure that the American people suffer and then he wants somehow for them to blame the Republicans. Well, the people on the left will do so. The people on the right most likely will not do so. It's the ones in the middle that everyone's fighting for, I assume. What would be your thoughts? Well, uh, this weekend I flew down to Dallas and back. And I flew down on the first day of sequestration. And so uh, I deliberately added uh, 30 minutes to my time uh, to wait around and cool my heels at the airport. 
And uh, when I got there, the airport was almost empty, and it's Dulles International. It was almost empty, and they waved me right through. I had no trouble at all getting through security. I probably took me five minutes total to take off my uh, clothes and all that stuff and go on the other side and redress and uh, went through there with no, no problem at all. When I flew back two days later, I did the same thing, and guess what? The same thing happened. In about five minutes, I was through. And so all of this talk about the sequestration and going through the TSA checkpoints, as far as I'm concerned, that was just a big, flat, white lie. I don't know what, that it was white, black, pink, or purple, but... It was Janet Napolitano. It, Janet Napolitano has been caught on the carpet, uh, not on the carpet, but has been called out. Because people are saying it is absolutely not true. There's not a single airport in America reporting any extra delays. There are none. It's just a lie. But you'll be happy to know that the 365,000 employees of TSA have all been uh, awarded new uniforms at a higher cost than what we pay for Marine uniforms, $1,000 each. Almost yep, $40 that's million. That's exactly right. Well, but two things. But first of all, you know, Airports weren't required to have TSA. They could have had privatized security at the airports, which some have done and have never had a problem with uh, long lines at their airports or people getting accosted by the workers there. And so this really illustrates the reason why we should get rid of TSA. It should be abolished today, replaced with private security at all of these airports. Then there would be no problem. No, there would never be a question again about whether uh, the government or, or sequestration or whatever would, would affect the operations at these airports because it would be pub privately owned and not publicly owned and give much better service along the way. By the way, they just announced you now can take a nail clipper or a pen knife, uh, you know, <clears throat> a, less than a two and a quarter inch blade, uh, on, on an airline with you. Well, hello. I mean, it's Well, just... I thought it was very nice of them to do that. Now I can, I, I can clip my fingernails. <laughs> <laughs> what they should say is everyone on the plane must be armed. Then try and take over the plane. <laughs> you know, you, you've seen in the movies, and they, we've had real stories of thieves, thugs, morons, walking into a bar to, to rob the place, and it's a cop bar. And, and all of a sudden, they've got, you know, 87 uh, guns aimed at them. Well, you know, whatever size the population on the plane, let's say there's 200 people, give or take. 100 to 200 people, if you know every one of them is carrying, uh, at the very minimum, a stun gun up to a, uh, a uh, hollow point loaded revolver so that it won't pierce the fuselage, which wouldn't do much anyway, uh, do you think that you're going to come in there with your box cutters and try and take over the plane? I don't think so. Not, not a chance. And, just, and uh, uh, you know, I, I have no trouble with... Um, with people being uh, 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 privately armed, you go through the training, you get your license, and you and you carry concealed carry, and there's nothing wrong with that. And I think it's the smart thing to do. Let's talk about the whole gun thing. You, you, you know, uh, there's stories abound. A five-year-old uh, uh, holds his finger out and is thrown out of school and charged with a felony. You know, a six-year-old uh, takes bites from his pop tart to where what's left looks like a gun, and he's expelled from school. Uh, a teacher tells a student that when they ask him, what did you do? And he says, well, you know, I went with my mom and dad to the firing range. That's what we did. Well, you get an F, because you can't talk about guns. Uh, it's just... Well, don't forget the kid that wore the Marine Corps shirt that had a gun on it. Oh, yeah, the, the crossed rifles. And, and, and the worst of all, the very worst one of all, was the little girl with the Hello Kitty bubble gun that got sent home for school for having a... Hello Kitty bubble gun at the school. Right. But if she said, hello, Michelle, she'd have gotten a medal. Uh, at any rate. Uh, by the way, I, we are, I take you up a collection. General, would you like to contribute? We've decided that Michelle Obama really needs a license plate when she walks in a public street. Uh, your thoughts? I'm not good at that, man. Yo. Yo. No. <laughs> and a backup beeper. <laughs> There's no, no way in the world you're going to get me down, uh, down, okay. down, down that road. Uh, Barack uh, Obama's job approval. But, but, let me, but let me share a little bit about, about guns with you. All right. Because there's this business, this thought about the culture of gun violence. Listen, people like me who spent much of their life in foxholes, 
thought that their weapons, whatever they may be, assault rifles, whatever we had, the old M14 when I was uh, running around foxholes, we we thought that th- we thought they were the best friends we had. Everybody in my unit, when when we were out, we had these little fold up cots. You pull a cot out, and the guy would go to sleep there on the cot, and in his hand or in or under the pillow, he would have a handgun. He would have a rifle or an assault rifle uh, laying right beneath him on the on the floor where he could get it. And so if you didn't have weapons around you, if you didn't have these culture of violence, guns around you, the chances were you were going to be dead come morning because we were fighting all the time. And so I just say to you, my friends, that uh, guns, to me, now, I'm not talking for anybody else, but guns to me are a friend. I find them very friendly. I find them very comfortable. And uh, even today, every once in a while, when I take one of my old weapons out and oil it, and just play with it, clean it a little bit, it brings back good memories. And so that's just the opposite of what everybody wants to hear about gun violence. But I got to tell you, folks. The reason that I'm alive and the reason I got promoted is because I got, I'm still alive. I got promoted because I lived. Without the guns, I wouldn't have made it. Well said, General. In fact, uh, what was it, uh, Patton, that said, glory is not dying for your country. Glory is making the other poor son of a gun die for his country. Amen. All right. Mm-hmm. Obama's approval ratings have dropped to 46%. It doesn't mean anything. But I do think that when we talk about influencing the middle, uh, that he's losing some of those people and therefore is going to be less likely to get away with what he's trying to get away with. And that is, say, uh, I'm the guy driving the car, but the other guy is responsible for me running over someone. Would you agree? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I, absolutely. I, I just am convinced that second terms are normally not good for any presidents. When you get a, a, a 24 karat phony like this one, who is what he is and does what he does, it's just hard even for the low information voters, as Rush Limbaugh has labeled them, uh, to keep fooling them because it's shown that people have lost average of about 22% of their net worth since he was elected. The fact is, in the minority community, it's a much higher number. And I don't care how much you feel good that someone else is hungry. If you're hungry, uh, it don't work. And we got a whole lot of hungry folks, a whole lot of unemployed folks, a whole lot of homeless folks, a whole lot of uh, desperate folks, uh, uh, and we got what? What's the number on food stamps down? Nearly fifty million. And 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 we need a leader who understands that what you have just said, and understands that there is only one way we're going to solve this problem. Uh, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt said, "Our greatest primary task is to put people to work." He says, "This is not unsolvable." He said, "We have to face this problem wisely and courageously." And I think that that's what we're missing. That's what we're lacking. That's, that's why this fellow that we have now can play politics all he wants to. He is not helping the poor person, the, the, the little bit below average wage earner. These people are struggling. They're trying to make a living. They're trying to get by. And they're trying to love Obama at the same time. Why, I don't know, but they are. And it won't work. Obama has no interest in them. He is not providing for them. He's not looking out for them. And he is not going to do anything that helps them in the the place they are in life. Amen. All right, we're going to take a quick break. We'll be back with Major General Jerry Curry, Chief Steve, and me in just a moment here on Talk to Solomon. I like to eat. 
You like to eat? We all do. And usually we run to the grocery store, we run to the convenience store, uh, or we have something in the fridge. But power's been out in parts of this country in the last few weeks. Uh, we don't know what's going to come down the pike economically. Smart people are putting in food. Alpine Air Gourmet Reserves is a line of foods that you can put away that will last for a very long time. You know, they say eat what you store and store what you eat. This is great tasting stuff, healthy for you, a full line. You go to our website, cpnlive.com, and click on the button for Alpine Air Gourmet Reserves and see all the different things we have. This is good tasting food. It's reasonably priced. It will last. And it's worth its weight in gold if a problem arises. I know you don't think there's going to be anything that goes wrong. Actually, you do. This is smart. This is smart insurance. This is smart preparation. This is smart thinking. You have kids. You have a spouse. You have parents. You have dependents. Uh, you have an appetite. All those things can be addressed by a, a, a frugal but smart investment in Alpine Air Gourmet Reserves. Try them out you will be tickled to death with the taste of them. You know what? In many cases, people start to eat this, and they think, heck, this tastes better and costs less than what you're going to the grocery store and buy. CPMLive.com. Check it out. Let me ask you a question. Do you like being sick? I have in my hand an incredible product. It's called TR10 Super Colloidal Silver. TR10 stands for a trace to the negative 10th power. The particles in this silver product are six to eight angstroms, six to eight ten billionths of a meter. Now listen to me. Silver has been the magic bullet for all of human existence. The Egyptians used silver instruments. We use silverware. They put silver in your teeth because nothing can grow on silver. Silver will kill anything but liberalism. I'm working on that. This product, you go to cpnlive.com, buy one quarter of this product, it will last you for a very long time, anytime you feel like you've been exposed to something bad, take some of this product, spray it in your mouth, or take a little bit and gargle it, swallow it, it will kill any pathogen. The average antibiotic kills 10 to 20 different pathogens. This product will kill 700 plus. Do yourself a favor, do your family a favor, do your doctor a favor, he's tired of seeing you. Get super colloidal silver, go to cpnlive.com, order the product, it's $29.95 plus shipping. I think it's $39.95 delivered any place in America right to your door. It's worth 10 times that. Check it out. If you're not 100% happy, just return it and we'll give you your money back. Do you like being healthy? I do. In fact, this product, which I've been taking for years now, is absolutely the answer. Now, you may not believe it, but I'm actually 21, plus tax, of course. This product has 146 different healthful nutrients in it. And it's liquid, so it's bioavailable. It tastes great, and it's sugar-free. One ounce of Sonic Life each day will help you to maintain and enhance your health. It's the kind of a gift, well, that you'll thank your mom for, your husband for, your wife for, your kids for. Whoever you give it to, they're going to say thank you. And you are going to enjoy the benefits of having all the vitamins, all the minerals, all the nutrients your body needs in one very reasonably priced product. Just go to cpnlive.com and everything's right there. You'll be able to read all the ingredients. The price is right there, a flat price delivered to your door anywhere in the United States of America. Sonic Life is a gift, a great gift. Give it to yourself. I do. Hey, my name is Stan Solomon, and you know if I have something to say, I'll say it. And I'll only tell you the truth because I'm a Republican, not a Democrat. Democrats always lie. Republicans only lie half the time. I don't lie at all. This is the fuel mule. It's an extraordinary product that was developed by a friend of mine, an engineer. And it increases the fuel mileage on your vehicle. If you have a combustion engine, this will increase your mileage by 10 to 20 percent. It bolts around your fuel line. You can install it yourself or have your mechanic do it. It is an extraordinary item and it flat works. I've been using it for more than 10 years. It's 
increase my mileage on every vehicle I put it on. And by the way, it will last forever. You can get rid of your vehicle. Just take it off and put it on the next one. Go to cpnlive.com. You'll have more information there. You can order it right there. We absolutely guarantee you'll be satisfied. The Fuel Mule. It's a way to kick down your cost of fuel and kick up your mileage. Don't you love the name? I thought of it. The Fuel Mule.